This is part two of the trend towards indoor relief. Although economical problems persisted in the United States, England's economy was in shambles. England's economy became more dependent on manufacturing interests and those interests gained power over agrarian interests. These interests including having access to laborers when needed and when needed being able to pay low wages. This required a large population needing to work and it was felt that public assistance was undermining this need. Therefore the desire to slash or even do away with public assistance became a popular refrain from the owners of industry. However a large population which was dependent on low wages for subsistence quickly became a discontented lot. It also resulted in large number of individuals from all walks of life asking and in some cases demanding assistance. The response from Parliament was to create the Royal Poor Law Commission for inquiring into the administration and practical operation of poor laws. The responsibility of this commission was to make recommendations for administration of poor laws faced with the changes taking place in the English economy. Sir Edwin Chadwick, who was the secretary of the commission, wrote the published report in 1834. The Chadwick report made it quite clear that the needs of the ruling industrial class would take precedence over the basic needs of citizens. Whether through outright denial, gross exaggeration, contemporary social philosophy presented by classical economists, and or general fears of the day, it was determined that the growing number of paupers was caused not by faults found within the economic system, but due to a system of public assistance that made it too easy to obtain. Along with this perception, there was also a concern of a lack of coordination in relief giving. With these concerns, two formal recommendations were made. Recognizing that the problem of relief was larger than that of any single unit, the first called for a national supervisory body with the authority to combine parishes in order to coordinate and thus improve poor law services throughout the land. Within three years, 90% of Great Britain's parishes were combined into 568 units, poor law districts, or unions, as they were called, presided over by boards of guardians, which affected some improvements in the public welfare system. The second recommendation was for an end to public assistance for able-bodied persons, except in public institutions. While the framers of the report thus did not intend for the principle to be applied to the helpless poor by implying, among other things, that the reduction of public relief and the cutting of taxes were the ideal, it was carried out indiscriminately. Most of those on public relief, the young and the old, the sick and the disabled, the unemployed and the underpaid, as well as the lazy, would be deprived of outdoor assistance. Curtailment of home relief also resulted from what was perhaps the most important aspect of the report, its general tone, which implied that poverty was an individual moral matter. An essential corollary to this, written into the report and its subsequent legislation, was the doctrine of, quote, less eligibility, unquote, the notion that the status of the, those dependent on public assistance, quote, shall not be made really or apparently so eligible as the situation of the independent laborers of the lowest class." Unquote. In other words, the condition of all welfare recipients, regardless of need or cause, should be worse than that of the lowest paid self-supporting laborer. While relief should not be denied the poor, life should be made so miserable for them that they would rather work than accept public aid. So, a brief review is now needed regarding the changes that have taken place from the Middle Ages to 1834. These changes, I argue, are a byproduct of the changes in the mode and means of production and represented the interest of the industrial owners which by 1834 was in power not only in the private economy but in Parliament as well. The trip then from the Middle Ages to 1834 brought with it a vast change in the public attitude toward the poor and the way in which they should be cared for. During the Middle Ages, evidence of need override all else. 
it was generally assumed that need arose from misfortune for which society, in all justice, should assume responsibility. The individual's right to public assistance was firmly established. The Elizabethan Poor Law of 1601 endorsed that right, placing the ultimate charge for implementing it upon secular authorities. It also distinguished between the impotent and the able-bodied poor, and acknowledged the existence of involuntary unemployment. By the early 19th century, conditions had changed. Industrial capitalism, urbanization, greater poverty, higher taxes, and the laissez-faire philosophy had made the pursuit and accumulation of wealth a moral virtue and dependency of vice. It was assumed that destitution was the individual's fault, and since most of the needy were recipients of help from the public treasury, it followed that public aid was a cause of pauperism, and thus inherently bad. If bestowed at all, it should be done so as carefully and as stringently as possible. Hence, in public institutions where, it was felt, the costs would be lower, the opportunity for control better, the chances of propagation fewer, and the deterrent power greater. England, then, has made the institutionalization of the poor not only a key component of public assistance, but the only component. This idea of rehabilitative institutions came from another sector of the society, the criminal justice system. Incarcerating criminals for long periods of time in hope of effecting their reformation was a novel concept in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. But the Enlightenment faith in human improvement suggested that isolation, quiet, and total surveillance were more potent than traditional physical punishments like whippings and branding. If penitentiaries could turn convicts into lawful citizens, then so too could a well-regulated almshouse make the poor self-reliant. Older almshouses simply housed the poor, but newer ones would operate as, quote, schools of industry, unquote. The influence of the classical economist and the laissez-faire philosophy in general, and the idea that public relief tended to pauperize and demoralize recipients and depress the standard of living in particular, had even more rigid exceptions in the United States than in England. Observers concluded that no one ought to be poor, and there was little tolerance for the able-bodied pauper. The only cause of such poverty, it was assumed, was individual weakness. As Nathaniel Ware, a social philosopher of the early 19th century saw it, the able-bodied man who begged or received public assistance was beyond redemption, having sunk to the level of a mere eating brute. Humanity aside, reported Ware, it would be to the best interest of society to kill all such drones. Thus, whereas colonials had accepted the notion that the poor must always be present and citizens are obliged to do whatever is necessary to help them, by the late 18th and early 19th century, Americans began to believe that poverty could and should be obliterated, in part, by allowing the poor to perish. A sermon given by Heman Humphrey, a Congregational Minister in 1818, entitled On Doing Good to the Poor, exemplified the idea that the growth of poverty constituted a sign of God's anger with the moral laxity of 19th century New Englanders. In his sermon delivered on a day of fasting, Humphrey outlined the causes of poverty and offered a series of curative steps for the redemption of the entire society. A section of the sermon demonstrates well his perception as to what has caused poverty. The entire reading is made available to you on the Angel platform. Man, by the fall, lost the image of his maker. He is totally depraved. Reason and conscience are dethroned, and enslaved by passion and appetite. Restless as he is, labor and business are extremely irksome. Indolence and vice are his favorite elements. If he can gain a subsistence, however scanty and precarious, without the sweat of his brow, he will not work. It requires strong motives, and even pressing necessities to rouse him to action, to make him industrious and frugal. I lay it down as a well-established maxim that no part of human industry is spontaneous. It is all the effect of habit, principle, and necessity. Take any number of human beings you please, 
in a state of nature, and not one of them will betake himself to any regular and laborious employment, so as long as he can subsist without it. Whoever heard of an industrious savage?'